Witam w Akademii Pszczelarza. Naszym gościem jest Per Kryger z Uniwersytetu w Aarhus. Hello. Hello, thank you. So maybe for, for the beginning you will say what you are doing in your work. Well, I'm a honeybee biologist. <laughs> I work on a lot of aspects because I'm from a small country. So I have the chance, the opportunity to do a lot of different things. If I could choose, I would only do genetics. But my main job is diseases. So I try to get these things to meet, to, to study the genetics of resistance or tolerance to, to bee diseases, if I can. Combine this all, this is what I want to, would, I would like to do, so that we do have better bees in the future. Every beekeeper will admit that the diseases are the main problem uh, with bees, not only Varroa, but also uh, Nozema. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, you, are, you worked with uh, Nozema. Could you tell us something more about it? Yes, so, so in Denmark, for, for a lot of years, we had big problems with Nozema. And queen breeders were also having problems with this, so, so they noticed. And they decided we must try to see if we can do something about it. And in Denmark they were lucky because they had a, a company, a school, that developed a computer system to count the number of Nosema spores in samples of bees. So you didn't have to have a human to sit and do that, you could have a computer to do it. And that's 30 years, about 30 years ago, so they were very advanced at this school who did this software and that we have been using this tool for now for 30 years in the selection of bees. So, so what the queen breeders in Denmark have been doing for 30 years, they, they control the colonies every year, they find the best colonies and then they take, in the springtime, they take a sample of 60 bees from all of their colonies, send them to the school and have the nosema counted. But in reality, they don't really need to count. They just look for nosema. If there's one nosema spore in the colony, or in the 60 bees, the queen is excluded from further breeding. So, so it's a very hard selection against nosema infection in the colony. And, and they've been doing that for 30 years. And we started with having 80% of the colonies were positive. They had nosema spores. Now, since years, we only have 20% or less of the colonies positive for Nosema. So, so a huge improvement and most of the improvement actually happened in the first five, six years. So, so we don't see Nosema in the samples anymore. But what is even more positive, we don't see Nosema disease in our bees. The bees seems to have found a mechanism to, to uh, not get sick from, from Nosema disease. So, so it really changed a lot. And, and of course this was the queen breeders and the breeding population, but it seems to be the whole, of the whole of the population in Denmark has improved through the effort of the breeders because they sell queens to, to the neighbor beekeepers and also the drones made with the neighbor colonies. So everybody now has resistant bees, tolerant bees, I should say, in Denmark. They, they, they get nosema, you can infect them with nosema, but they just refuse to die. They even refuse to get sick. So, so, so they are very strong against nosema. And, and I, I know from, from a big study we have done that in Poland the situation is not so good on Nosema. So I think this is something that you can learn from, from us. You shouldn't get bees from Denmark, but you should get the message from <laughs> Denmark. Uh, you said that it was very hard selection. Uh, in, from genetic point of view, do you think that, of course you have now uh, bees resistant to uh, Nosema, but do you think that in the process you lost some of biodiversity in, in your bees? Yes, we did. We, I mean, and every selection that is, is a cost. I mean, that's hopefully more, more win than cost, but of course we lost some of the genetic diversity in this process. And, and I mean, one of the reasons why we had such a big success is also because we have a very well-developed system of mating stations in Denmark, which is the queen breeders did not only do selection on the queens, there was also selection on the drone side. So all the colonies that would produce drones would also be Nosema tolerant. So, so there was selection both of the queen side and on the drone side, and that really helped for fast progress. You, you, if you don't have control over the matings, it would be much more difficult to achieve in such a short time. So it's a, a, a big achievement. But do you think that uh, at the same time we can uh, breed colonies resistant to Nosema and that, that can manage the Varroa 
infestation. This is. A, I think yes. I think you can do it, but of course you need to. You, you will have. It will be quicker to do one or to do the other one. To do both, you will have to do more selection, and you will actually lose genetic even more genetic diversity. It will be much more difficult. So if I. If I should choose, well, from a Danish perspective, of course, it's Varroa that is the problem because we have solved Nosema, <laughs> but 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 I think Varroa it's more difficult to it's much more difficult to do because we know of a lot of a lot of projects around the world that have tried, and we still don't see on the market a Varroa tolerant bee. That nobody is selling a Varroa tolerant bee, at least not one that works elsewhere. When you bring these bees from a from one place to another place, normally the resistance disappears. This is not the same with this Danish bees. They have been moved to France and to Germany, put into the lab and tested, and they are still they're still nosema tolerant. So 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 I think it's more complicated with Varroa. So if you were a simple beekeeper mm -hmm. in Poland, yes. and what would you do to help uh, f this, this to help this process? It, genetics is difficult, so so you need you need tools. And uh, I mean, for Nosema, we had a simple tool in Denmark. If you don't have a simple tool, it will be very difficult to do selection. So and and I think this is one of the problems with Varroa mites. We do not have an easy way to to distinguish a Varroa tolerant colony from a Varroa susceptible colony. So this is one of our problems that it's not so easy to do a good selection because you do not really know what what you see in your colony. So, so, so we need to develop a good tool for detecting the Varroa resistant or Varroa tolerant colonies. We are working on that here at the <laughs> moment. Uh, I think we will achieve that too, but, but I think this is a main difficulty with uh, Varroa is we are not so good in the selection process at the moment. And it's at least it's, we were good in the institute. The beekeeping institutes are doing a good work on this. But we cannot really transfer this technology to beekeepers because it takes a lot of work, a lot of man hours, and beekeepers just don't have this time, and and also take some expertise in some cases. So, okay, maybe simple beekeeper cannot help, but oh no 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 sorry, we need the beekeepers to help because the institutes, even the biggest institutes, only have four or five or six hundred colonies. They can never solve this problem. We we need. We need to get the beekeepers involved, and, and this is one of the main targets that we have to have. We need to get as many beekeepers involved as possible, because else we will get into the problem that you just mentioned. We will, we will lose genetic diversity. So, so it doesn't help that we have a varroa resistant bee. We need to have varroa resistant bees all over Poland, all over Europe. So, so, so everybody must get involved, or as many people as possible yeah. must, must participate. That's the dream that w yeah. we would have the bees uh, resistant to any disease. But you work on, uh, with beekeepers. You yes. checked. Uh, yes, we, I was a part of a of a very big uh, European project, which has has was completed in 2014. The work with the bees. But what we basically was done, we went to visit all over Europe, 17 countries, 3,000 different apiaries almost 3,000 different beekeepers, I think. Uh, we visited them in autumn, we checked their bees, we took samples from their bees, and then we went back in spring to see how have the bees survived, and we came back after the summer to see are the bees still alive or have they died. So, so the advantage was we had samples from the bees from autumn, and we could look at diseases in the colonies in autumn, and then we could see, okay, does this disease kill the bees? Does this does Nosema kill the bees if we find it in autumn? Are they then dead in winter? Is Varroa a cause of... And the data were not very satisfactory. I mean, the disease questions were not so clear. Uh, the biggest problem for the bees, it turned out, is not Varroa mites, it's not Nosema. It has two legs. <laughs> it's a beekeeper. <laughs> uh, so, so bad beekeepers are the problem for the bees. Uh, and, and what is a bad beekeeper? Um, we all know him. <laughs> is, is he other beekeeper? No, it's not. It's not so simple <laughs> as that. No, it, young and unexperienced beekeepers. It's not so difficult to understand. They haven't learned the tricks. They haven't learned the business yet. They lose a lot of their bees. 
old beekeepers who are maybe not really up to date, who are not following, maybe they are also losing some of the energy to keep the bees, they lose bees. Hobby beekeepers lose bees because they, they lose more bees than professional beekeepers because professional beekeepers have a lot more experience, they see many more bees, they know quicker and of course they have a bigger interest in keeping their bees alive. Uh, so something simple that can be done, it is clear from this from these very big studies, beekeepers who go to courses who to take training in beekeeping, they have fewer losses than beekeepers who don't follow trainings, who do not participate in training. So this is a very simple way to, to become a more successful beekeeper. Go and learn more and, and you don't have to do it, you don't don't think that you can do this in the first year when you start beekeeping and then you never need to do it again. You need to do it again and again because there's whole things are new things, the whole time there's new things coming up, there's new methods that you need to learn. And then every beekeeper can be his own teacher. When you do something with your bees, write it down. Write it down. Because next spring when you find that some of your colonies are dead, you can check, ah, this is a colony that I fed 15 kilos of sugar, the colonies that I fed 20 kilos of sugar is alive. You learn, okay, 5 kilos is expensive, 5 kilos extra for food, but 15 kilos was actually more expensive because they are all lost now. So, 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 so simple things, take note and, and check your notes. Keep, keep a track of what you're doing and learn from your mistakes. That is, that is a key message of this. So, so beekeepers is really the biggest problem and it's an easy problem to solve. That's nice because we can just invite the beekeepers to come and learn more. And, and if they do that, it would be but much better, both for them and for their bees. So uh, uh, le let me underline the message. We don't necessarily need a super bee or a super chemical. What we need is education, right? Yes, yes. yes. So I think this is the main message of our talk. And thank you very much for yes. being here. Yes, I appreciate it. You're welcome. It. And please go and listen to what the experts have to say. We are here for you. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes.